15 minutes. Um, I actually don't even know if I can do that, but I'll do, do my best. Trends in longevity, why the future will not be like the past. The Faustian bargain, a uh, new paradigm in public health has emerged. I'm really gonna emphasize that as much as I can. And then breakthroughs in aging biology are forthcoming. I'm going to discuss that briefly. I'm gonna show a couple of videos uh, at the end uh, that will illustrate some of the issues. So let me, let me jump right into this. Just to give you a sense of, of what human mortality and longevity looks like, this is, this is a picture of death. This is basically what uh, mortality looks, looks like uh, for humans, high early age mortality, declines to its lowest point of puberty, rises exponentially thereafter. The age trajectory of death for humans has never changed. The death rate's gone down, life expectancy's gone up, but you can count on the age tra trajectory of mortality remaining constant. It gives us a real important, valuable picture about uh, human longevity, and in a way, it sort of gives us a sense about where the future uh, is headed as well. Now, years ago, uh, my colleagues and I published this piece in the New England Journal of Medicine predicting that life expectancy in the U.S. would decline. Uh, we published this in 2005. Of course, everybody disagreed with us. They said, no, 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 life expectancy is gonna continue to rise. Um, indeed, it has uh, uh, leveled off and gone down, uh, not just in the United States. Um, this actually is, the, is a more recent trend in life expectancy in the US. Since about 2010, we've seen a leveling off. But as it turns out, it's not just in the United States. It's in many parts of the world. We see this in the UK. This is the age standardized death rate. Uh, beginning right around 2010, it began to, uh, to level off. Uh, this is uh, showing you, you know, pe people had believed that death rates would decline by one to 2% annually. Um, it's not happening. After about 2010, it began to decelerate. I'll explain some of the reasons why this is the case, but it's not just uh, uh, entire national populations, it's subgroups within the population as well have experienced the deceleration in the rate of improvement. Um, not entirely unexpected unless you think that we're gonna continue to grow to seven or eight feet tall or run a mile in under one minute or um, you know, there's lots of things that operate in a linear fashion. As it turns out, life expectancy is not one of them. So um, this, this deceleration in the rate of improvement has really uh, been seen now in many parts of the world. This was, uh, came out in 2017, but since then, we've now seen this spread uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, for the most part, in most parts of the world, the rise in life expectancy has decelerated. Uh, and we anticipate that it will continue uh, to do so. Now, my colleagues and I published a piece a few years ago forecasting uh, what was going to happen with mortality rates in many parts of the world. It, uh, and I'm not gonna go into detail on this except to say when I saw Finbar's presentation earlier, you remember the backpack that was on the back of the individual, right? When they were standing out and looking forward. This, this is what's inside the backpack, right? So basically, uh, this is an, these are age period cohort models. You're looking at the attributes of individuals that they are uh, that they that, that are born that they're born with or that they acquire during the course of life, and these these are called age period cohort models or APC models. We've used them to generate estimates of lifespan and health span uh, going forward, predicting this deceleration in the rate of improvement. That is exactly what uh, what has happened. So these APC models, opening up that backpack, I think is really valuable to give you a sense of where things. Uh, are headed in the future. Here's an age pyramid, uh, which you saw uh, uh, earlier. This is extremely valuable uh, to look at. Um, you know, I'm a, I was trained as a demographer, so we look at these all the time, but there's a story in here that we often don't see. This is, happens to be for Canada in 2006. Doesn't really matter what developed country you're looking at. They all look basically the same. Uh, you know, you see the baby boomers born between 46 and 64, the echo, of the baby boomers, if you were to generate a forecast of, of anything, let's say death rates or, or, or longevity, um, one of the ways in which it's commonly done today is you look at what's happened in the past. You will take mortality rates or death rates from an extinguishing population. In other words, you look up the age structure, 
what happened to previous generations, you know, often born in the beginning of the 20th century, and then you make forecasts going forward. What we've suggested uh, is that you're looking at the wrong place. If you're looking up the age structure, if you want to get a sense of what the future is going to be, you look down here at people that are alive today. You open up that backpack, and it really gives you a sense of what's going on with uh, future generations, and that's where these APC models, I think, um, are extremely valuable. Let me just give you a couple of predictions based on some work that has been done recently uh, by my colleagues and I. Hispanic life expectancy in the U.S., as you may know, is the highest among any subgroup. We are predicting it is about to decline. Uh, it has to do with second and third generation Hispanics moving through the age structure. Uh, it will uh, have an additional negative burden on uh, life expectancy. Um, I will argue that advances in biomedical technology, which I'm about to get to, will accelerate. Uh, the first subgroups of the population that will benefit from this will be the wealthy, uh, more highly educated subgroups of the population. Life expectancy in Japan will soon level off and decline. Um, we can get into details about why that's the case, but these are some of the predictions that you get uh, from, from APC models. Now, let me get into this last point here because this is the exciting part. This is what I'm really most excited about right now. now I'm sure many of you have heard of the story of Faust. This is Goethe's Faust from, from more than, than uh, a century ago. Let me tell you the story here very simply and quickly. Uh, of course, you know the, the story of Faust is uh, an intellectual is disillusioned with his own limits. Uh, he's approached by the devil, Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles makes him an offer in exchange for his soul. I'll uh, give you a longer life and you know, e eternal youth. And you know, it's a metaphor for a bad deal, basically. You, you, know, the, you know the Faustian bargain. Well, so let me, let me explain what, what has gone on in our world, what we've done to ourselves. Imagine that in 1850, Mephistopheles came to humanity and said, I've got a deal for you. You know, back then, life expectancy was, was under 50. Infant mortality rates were extremely high. The devil comes to us and says, humanity, I've got a deal for you. I'm going to allow you to dramatically reduce your early age mortality, save your children, allow you to live an extra 30 years. What do you say? What do you say? Um, so humanity signed the papers. You know, if I was around in 1850 and the devil came to me with that deal, I would have signed the papers um, in 1850. Sure, save my children, give me an extra uh, 30 years of life. What did we get as a byproduct as a result of that? Heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, sensory impairments, all the things that we see that occur in aging bodies. So we should have known back in 1850 that that was the, that was the deal that we were going to get, and I think we would have signed up for that. So the rise of these diseases is not a consequence of failure. It's a consequence of success, of living long enough to experience the diseases and disorders associated with growing older. Now, here's the key. The devil has come to us again. Mephistopheles is standing in front of us today, making us another offer. And here's the offer. I'm going to allow you to continue to reduce the risk of death from heart disease, cancer, stroke, you know, the things that, you, that I gave you. Uh, 150 years ago in exchange for those additional 30 years of, of life. Um, and I'm just telling you in advance, you're going to get incrementally smaller improvements in, in life expectancy. Um, you'll get more people that make it out uh, to older age. But the price that we're going to have to pay for this is, uh, a, a, I mean, remember, death is a zero-sum game. So when something goes down, something else must eventually go up. And the question is, what's going to go up if heart disease, cancer, and stroke go down. And many of us in the field of aging and aging biology believe that the neurological conditions associated with an aging brain are one of the uh, most serious uh, considerations that we have to deal with. So my colleagues and I have argued, don't sign the papers. This is not a good deal, which is basically another way of saying, maybe we should rethink the way we are, we are going after aging today. Instead of just attacking one disease at a time, as if they're all somehow independent of each other, maybe we should go after the underlying biological risk factor for, a, uh, for aging, which is basic biology itself, the biology of aging. Let me illustrate very briefly. Um, I'm actually going to skip most of the slides after this. But this was uh, from an article that I published in JAMA in 2018. 
illustrating what we've done to ourselves. So this is the distribution of death, just basically, basically illustrating in 1900, high early age mortality. Uh, there's maternal mortality right there. Uh, and you know, we, this is what death looked like in 1900. This is what death looks like today. It looks the same in Singapore, in Hong Kong, uh, in all developed countries. It looks exactly the same. There's gonna be some minor variation, but basically this is it. And I've placed this distribution of death against a backdrop of frailty and disability, which I call the red zone. The red zone is a time period during which frailty and disability rises exponentially. So the focus of me medicine and medical technology and attacking one disease at a time is on the blue line, trying to push the blue line out uh, into deeper and deeper regions of the red zone, and therein lies the danger. And that's the argument that, that my colleagues and I have been making recently, is that our focus should not be on the blue line. The focus should be on the red zone. We should be trying to compress this. Now, there's a lot of variability, as you might imagine, in when the red zone hits from one person to the next, but basically, this is what it looks like. And the focus on aging biology and trying to slow the biological process of aging is not designed to make us live longer. It's not designed to push out that blue, blue line. It's designed to compress this red zone and extend the period of, of, uh, of healthy life and compress the period of frailty, frailty and disability in the population. Now, I'm gonna skip over all the other slides that I have. I have lots of them, but I have two things that I wanna show you because this sounds like a bunch of words, right? Great idea. Let's slow the biological process of aging. This is no longer hypothetical. It's actually been accomplished in other species. There's a large group of research scientists uh, that have come together under this banner of GERO science or the longevity dividend, basically suggesting that the time has arrived to change this paradigm. And I wanna show you two brief videos, if that's okay, and then I'm gonna be done in, in two minutes. Let me do the best that I can. So let me pass by all this stuff and, and, and get, get to the end. These are all the interventions, by the way, but I'm gonna, you don't get, get to see those. Um, let's take a look at these quick videos, and one of the stars is in the audience, actually. So um, do I have to press a button to make it start? If they can win support from the highest reaches of government, scientists believe they can change our nation's outlook on aging. They meet with the ranking member of the Senate Aging Committee to make their case. So nice of you to meet with us. Of Thank course. you. And what people don't realize is we have found a way to intervene with aging. And these concepts have been proven in animals and is now going to be tested in humans. The major risk uh, for any one of the diseases is aging. Instead of thinking it as an individual disease, thinking about it okay, as we get older, this is what our bodies do, and we address that issue instead of, I've gotta worry about diabetes, or I gotta worry about a stroke, or I've gotta worry about Alzheimer's. Yeah, what we've discovered is that basically if we learn how to treat those underlying causes, we can delay all these diseases that kill and debilitate people as a group. People don't realize that just reducing adult onset of diabetes by a reasonable, modest percentage is enough to get us out of debt. So I can imagine if we can do this across the board, just delaying slightly, and of course the train wreck that's coming in, the pro in all of our government programs is in fact the demographic. All right, so I'm um, actually, there's a little bit more to that, but I wanna end with this last video because this is where the breakthrough occurred. This was actually covered by National Geographic a couple of years ago. And here you're gonna see us meet with uh, the Food and Drug Administration. And the, the idea here is to get them to accept a new research protocol designed to go after the biological process of aging as a therapeutic intervention, and we succeeded. So take a look at this, and right after this, I will stop. Today, Dr. Barzilai and his colleagues will try to convince the FDA to consider their study. In advance of their critical meeting, they gather to prepare. We are here representing the field of the science of aging. And we think that this is a historical day for us because we're going to offer something that we believe is paradigm changing. I really want to frame the discussion today as
is what would we need to show in a clinical trial that would allow the FDA to approve a new indication for metformin for delaying multiple morbidities related to aging. Because we think metformin is the first one, but there are others that could be better than metformin, and we want to make sure that that's the template. We have that hypothesis that metformin is one of those rare opportunities where it might act in a general fashion. It's an attractive hypothesis. The trial is required to see if it's true. It started with a conceptual innovation that aging can be modified. Then years of work by a growing number of scientists in labs around the world and years of convincing people of their ideas. Maybe this is what a breakthrough looks like. If the FDA accepts that aging can be treated, the scientists believe it will forever transform healthcare and medicine. I don't think that there are too many interventions in history that would rival the type of intervention that we're talking about here. It would influence almost everyone. As a matter of policy, the FDA does not allow cameras into official proceedings. But they did agree to an interview immediately following their meeting. We have lots of experience with claims to decrease the rate of heart attacks, to decrease the, uh, the degree of dementia, drugs that prevent strokes, uh, drugs that uh, treat your diabetes. We have lots of experience with all that. But what's being sought and being talked about is a more broad claim to prevent a lot of the consequences of aging. So the question for us is, how do you show that? We gauged their willingness to accept the general approach of targeting aging, something that they said right off the bat, we've never done anything like this before, and they were very receptive. Their hope is that a wide variety of age-related problems, you know, loss of muscle tone, dizziness, falling, dementia, loss of eyesight, all of those things, to do them all at once with a single treatment, that might make a convincing case that you're doing something beyond just treating the disease. That would, that would be something never done before. They didn't have any problem with the general approach. And I asked them specifically at the end, this is what I think I'm hearing. You don't have any problems with the general approach. And they basically said yes. So I don't think we could have had a better outcome. If you really are doing something to alter aging, the population of interest is everybody. But it surely would be revolutionary if they can bring it off. All right, so I'm going to stop there and just basically say that this work in aging biology, in my view, is the next big thing in public health. This, uh, it's an extraordinarily exciting time to be working uh, in this area, and I'm, I'm really uh, excited at the prospect uh, of what's going on and I, I'm uh, anticipating a, a breakthrough in our lifetime. And by the way, Nir Barzilai is in the audience here, so if you have any really detailed questions, ask him. Thank you. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce David Canning, who is going to be giving us a, also a brief talk on the economics of health and aging in diverse societies and developmental contexts. Professor Canning is the Richard Saltonstall Professor of Population Sciences and Professor of Economics and International Health at the Department of Global Health and Population at the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, he, with David Bloom, originated the concept of the demographic dividend, uh, which we are now really leapfrogging off of in all of the discussions today. David. Thank you very much. Uh, and that was an excellent talk by Jay. Uh, and what I want to do is ac echo some of the points that were made earlier this morning uh, by John Beard. Uh, and I, I put all my ideas onto one slide. I have lots more slides, but I think uh, there are five ideas I want to get across. The first idea uh, echoes John's point about the importance of metrics and measurement. We need to know what we're trying to achieve. And a fundamental point is that longer healthy lifespans are an enormous gain for human welfare. We live in a world where we're much better off than we were 100 years ago. 
but we're still dominated in the discourse on welfare with an income per capita approach. And I see this as an enormous failing of economics. Um, so uh, if we'd had three years of recession of falling incomes in the United States, everyone would know about it and be talking about it. The United States has just experienced three years of declining life expectancy. That's an enormous loss of human welfare. That should be on the front page of the paper. Many Americans don't know that. Jay mentioned, Jay um, um, was just talking about this. We, we're, we have to emphasize health as a component of human welfare and improve our measures. Secondly, I think one of the big achievements in development over the last um, 50 years has been with the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were fundamental in changing development because they were welfare oriented. We wanted to reduce child mortality, we wanted to reduce poverty. That revolutionized the development field where people were focusing on intermediate outcomes. It forced people to get an evidence base. Is your intervention actually reducing poverty? Is it changing child mortality? If we're going to improve healthy aging, we have to know what that means. And I think this disease-focused approach, which we've just heard about, is the wrong approach. We need to define healthy aging, we need to measure it, and then we need to evaluate our interventions. We need to evaluate healthcare, we need to uh, look at environmental interventions such as air quality, and say, is, are these interventions worth paying for, and are they improving our health metrics? I see a, a problem in a lot of health systems research is that people are stopping at what I would consider intermediate outcomes. They're not going all the way to human welfare, and we need to do that. A second point, which again I think John mentioned, is that against this story of enormous success, we have this problem of inequality. And income inequality has been a rising issue in many countries, and that's leading to all sorts of social tensions. But we have to realize the problem is much worse than we think. The reason it's much worse is that inequality is not only in incomes, but it's also in longevity and in health status. And all of these, these three things go together. The rich people live longer and they're healthier. The inequality is, ma is massive. And the problem today is that it's not so much across countries. All rich countries are getting long life expectancies. But within countries, rich people are living 15 years longer than poor people. This inequality within societies is an enormous problem. We heard uh, just in the last talk that the new medical interventions may go to the better off because they can afford them. If our healthy aging is, health, is a healthy aging for the wealthy but not the poor, that's going to cause enormous tensions in society. We have to have metrics that take into account inequality. The third issue is that we know that our current institutional arrangements in many countries are unsustainable given population aging. And an enormous problem in the discourse around aging is that we think we have to change people in order to sustain the institutions. And that's completely the wrong way around. When I ever hear people say, people have to work longer so we can keep the social security system funded, that's completely the wrong way of thinking. The purpose of institutions is to improve human welfare. We don't change people so we can sustain the institutions, we change the institutions so we can improve the welfare of people. So this bad way of thinking, I think, permeates the view, and it's why we get this view that aging is a problem. The problem is not the old people. The problem is the institutions, and it's the institutions that have to change. But institutional change is very difficult. The institutions are very resistant to it. In order to change, we need to change economic incentives and social norms. I used to be an economist. People laugh at that, and the reason they laugh is they think it's an incurable disease. <laughs> it's not. You can get a cure. If you work for 15 years in a public health school, you can cure your economics. <laughs> Social norms are incredibly important. Just changing incentives isn't enough. There's a very negative view of old people in society. There is ageism. And we can't change the way we deal with aging if we don't change the norms. 
And one of the most shocking things I saw is when you look at ageism, part of it is people are worried that old people demand resources, and that takes away resources for young people, which is a rational view, I think. A rational issue we can address. Actually, a large part of ageism is that young people don't like old people being happy. They think that old people enjoying themselves in age of inappropriate ways really makes them feel bad. And that's, I don't know what that is, it's envy, but it's inappropriate, it's, it's wrong. So I would encourage all of you here, all of, the, all of us older people, let's be happy in age inappropriate ways. <laughs> And the reason we have to do that, the only way you change social norms is by challenging people's expectations. That's the way social norms get changed. And so we have to, we have to change. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of this, something I've worked towards in the last few years, including sexual behavior in aging surveys. There was resistance to this, but sex, sexual behavior is one of the biggest fun parts of life. And this concept that old people shouldn't do it is a bizarre concept. And we have to change people's views on that. So challenging people's expectations is really important. And actually, I would say, I do think that Singapore is an example that other countries can follow. Because I see here the policies are not just about incentives, but there are actually policies around changing norms. So those are all the ideas. The rest is just details. <laughs> we need better ways of measuring welfare. We need to move away from this focus on money and income as a measure of success, a focus on broader measures, and I think we have to include at least longevity, leisure, uh, and health status as well as income. We also need to adjust for risk. This issue that risk is uh, key, I think, is really important. And a lot of policies that try to adjust for aging, do it by passing risk on to older people. But actually, people really don't like risk. So it's not just the average outcome that matters, but the outcome at the extremes. And reducing risk in society is incredibly important. And we should use these broader measures of welfare to evaluate policies. There's a lot of talk about health here, but there's also an issue in economics, is at some point you have to go to the finance minister and ask for money. And he's going to ask, what is the value of health? Why should I be spending money on health when I could be spending it on economic growth? And I think health has to counterattack. It's not to try to justify the value of health. I actually think health's self-evident. We should counterattack and say, well, what's the value of money? That's any question economists very seldom asked. But actually, we know the value of money. It's very easy to estimate the value of money. Uh, we have a concept of quality-adjusted life years. You can do income-adjusted life years. How many life years would someone give up for more money? And the answer is, if you look at this graph, this is calculating income-adjusted life years. How valuable is money? It's incredibly valuable for poor people. Poor people will give up a lot of life years for money. I've normalized this graph, so one is the uh, average income in the US, about $23,000 a year. If you increase income 40 times, up to a million dollars a year, 40 times increase in income, you get about three times the welfare increase. It's very hard to make people happier in developed countries by giving them more money. There are diminishing returns to income. So what's the point of giving people more money? We should be giving them more life years, because life years are a much more intrinsic measure of value. A healthy life year is a much more intrinsic measure of value than money, particularly since money becomes less and less valuable as you get rich. I do think if you're in a poor country, if you're in a very low-income country, focusing on economic growth is incredibly important. But if you're in a rich country, economic growth is not what's making people happy. This graph shows uh, the lifetime welfare at age 60 by decile in the US. So looking at the welfare of the top decile, they have higher welfare, which is the green bar. Some of that is higher consumption. They have more income, so they consume more. But they also have more 
quality adjusted life years. If you look at leisure, actually, leisure doesn't vary by welfare quintile. But the better off people in the United States have both more income and longer healthy lifespans. Inequality is much worse because not only are the, the rich richer than the poor, they also have more longevity. So this looks at welfare ratios by decile at age 60. So the column on the right is the ratio of the, someone on the 90th percentile in the welfare distribution relative to the 10th. So if you just look at lifetime consumption, we think they're seven times better off. They're consuming seven times more. But if you look at lifetime welfare, including the fact that they live longer and have better health, they're 23 times better off. Inequality in the US is much worse than it looks. And that's true of every society around the world. This age gradient that the top of the income distribution is 10 years or maybe 15 years extra life relative to the people at the bottom is fairly uniform across developed countries. And I think this is an enormous problem. And I do worry that if our increases in healthy longevity are focused on the, on the well-off, we will exacerbate the tensions in society. There has to be a focus on the worst off, uh, and that's very, very difficult. Getting behavior change, getting access to healthcare across the income distribution, I think is a much more difficult task than just improving the average. <coughs> just to emphasize the issue of risk, this is uh, an estimate of the output and welfare effects of effective rural health insurance in China. Uh, China is moving from a system of no insurance in the rural, rural sector to providing insurance and gradually increasing it. Our estimates are that all of those changes are lowering output, consumption, capital, and hours worked. One of the reasons people in China work so hard and so long is they need money to pay for health care. Life is very risky. If you take away that risk, they actually work less. There's a reduction in output, a reduction in GDP per capita, but welfare goes up enormously by 11 percentage points because of the risk, the absence of risk. So this thing, this idea that it's all about economic growth is wrong. We can make society a better place, even with lower incomes, if we reduce the risk in society. And I do worry that a lot of the ways that we're trying to sustain institutions is by moving risk, for example, in defined benefit pensions into defined contribution pensions, which makes them sustainable, but it moves the risk to the individual and away from society as a whole. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about aging in Singapore. I think Singapore is a good model in many ways. But I won't talk about the details. I think there are issues around the details of the Singapore system. I think, to me, the great thing about the Singapore approach to aging is its long-term perspective. When you think about policies in Singapore, there's a long-term perspective, perhaps a 50-year perspective, thinking about not just sustainability, but improving welfare. A big difference I see in many other countries, including the United States and UK, is there's a short-term perspective on quick fixes and very short-term behavior and not planning for the long-term. So I think this, this issue of planning for the long-term is really important. And I, I think this is part of the institutional change I was talking about. It's very difficult to see how we can get that in our current uh, institutional arrangements. I would say when I talk about institutional change, it's not just governments. I mean families, and work and employment and communities. Institutional change is a very broad, uh, uh, a very broad set of things. So I'd just like to finish by, by going back to this overview and just emphasizing these points. Longer healthy lifespans are enormous gain to human welfare. But we have to define the metric. What are we trying to achieve? And then evaluate things. I think uh, we just heard about this prospect, uh, particularly from the animal studies, that we may, it may be possible to have longer healthy lifespans through these broad-based aging rather than disease-specific interventions. That is going to put extra challenges on society. 
but we then have to focus on changing the institutions to adapt to those. And this thing that we don't want to do it, we don't want to have longer life because that's inconsistent with our institutions and we have to maintain the institutions, has to be challenged at every point. We have to change the institutions to improve welfare, not the other way around. And then to go back to this point about social norms, I think the real problem in aging is not through the incentives and the rational approach, is that there's a negative view of aging. It's almost as bad as death. I mean, death gets bad publicity. Aging is similarly got a bad press. We need to change the terms. We need to change the ideas. Every time I hear the phrase dependency ratio, I cringe. You call them dependents, and then you, th you, you, you think it's a bad thing. We need to change the terminology and what we do. And let me just re-emphasize my point I made at the beginning again. We need more age-inappropriate fun behavior to change the social norms. Thank you. So from the first two talks, you can tell we were serious about wanting disruptive thinking and deeply appreciate it. Um, I'm now very honored to introduce uh, our third and final speaker in this session, uh, Charlene Chang. Ch Dr. Excuse me, I'm used to saying doctor. <laughs> Ms. Ch Ms. Chang is not in your uh, program, and she, but she is eminently qualified to step in to talk about community-based approaches to longer, healthy lives. She is uh, an attorney with a long career of leadership in Singapore. She is currently the group director of the Aging Planning Office in the Ministry of Health, where she oversees the development and implementation of the National Aging Agenda to bring about the national vision of opportunities, communities, and a city for all ages. She has an eminent career before that uh, as the Senior Director for Transformation at the Public Service Division in Singapore, and before that, leading um, the Trade Development Board, negotiating for Singapore bilateral free trade agreements, and a number of other important roles. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Linda. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning to everyone. I'm, thank you for having me here today. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to be here to be part of this very esteemed panel. It's also a great pleasure for me to see this uh, workshop come to fruition. I think it's been a long journey of many months of work, on hard work on the part of many people. Um, my team has been on board as well supporting it, and it's great to finally be here today. And so um, my theme today for the segment, uh, the, this segment, or rather the, the theme that was given to me by the organizers, is uh, community-based approaches to longer, healthier lives. And um, I, I must say that this captures very neatly in a nutshell the key cornerstone of our endeavors in the ministry towards healthy longevity. I mean, it's, it's almost as if the organizers are kind of keeping a close eye on what we're doing in the ministry, um, which, which is great. It was very helpful because we didn't have to do the kind of usual mental acrobatics that we had to do to fit what we're doing into the theme that we're given. Um, it's also very reassuring. It's also very reassuring to know that I think there's broad alignment in terms of what we're doing as a ministry and as a country with what the perspectives are from our friends around the world. And um, I think it's also excellent um, because as I hope to spend the next couple of minutes explaining, that it's very much critical for us to have uh, the kind of alignment and integration from multiple stakeholders to be able to, to um, tackle this issue of healthy longevity. <clears throat> so I don't think we need very much in terms of context setting. Um, throughout this morning, you've heard about how the world is aging and Singapore, of course, is no different. Um, my senior minister of state has mentioned that by 2030, we will have over 900,000 people in Singapore over the age of 30, uh, sorry, over the age of 65, and this is one in four Singaporeans. So we're a rapidly aging country, 
And you can see that um, in our life expectancy. So our life expectancy is almost 85 years, 84.5. We overtook Japan last year. Uh, we have the honor of overtaking Japan last year, dubious or otherwise, with the highest life expectancy, um, <clears throat> one of the highest life expectancies in the world. And then what we see also is on the table here on the right, that in terms of our healthy life expectancy, we also have one of the highest in the world, and this is um, 70, about 74 years. But I think what I wanted to underscore was that if you take a look at these two statistics together, uh, Singaporeans will still spend an average of about 10 years in ill health. And um, quite frankly, I think 10 years is a long time. I guess that's the price we're paying for our Faustian bargain. It's 10 years in ill health. And so even though um, healthy life expectancy, you know, we acknowledge it does come with its related health, economic and uh, social challenges. Um, I completely agree with you, David, that the problem is not older people. The problem is not uh, people, um, <clears throat> aging people. It, we can turn it around. We can turn this around to be a force for good as well. And what we need to do is to be able to unleash the potential and harness this potential that will come with longevity. And so, you know, having signed the papers with the devil, how can we renegotiate some of these terms? <clears throat> so, in order to maneuver this demographic transition, and uh, in order to identify and reap these benefits, think what we think is necessary are policies, uh, social economic infrastructures, and innovations that will come together to promote and advance the health of our older population. And in order to get there, really, we need not just a whole of government approach, but we need a whole of society response. We need a whole of society response involving a multi-ministerial approach as well as multi-sectoral approach in the community, in the society, so that we can do well across the different dimensions. <clears throat> and uh, I have a few examples here of how we're doing. If we look at this very sprightly gentleman here on his ukulele and some of the pictures at the side here, this is our action plan for successful aging. And this action plan for successful aging was developed in 2015. It's a $3 billion national blueprint that covers over 70 initiatives uh, across 12 areas. And this is something that the Senior Minister of State, Amy Kaur, had mentioned briefly in terms of its construct. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that it really is a very inclusive and engaged process that we went through. You can see some examples here. We took about a year <clears throat> to consult extensively uh, and engage extensively with multiple stakeholders uh, across our society. So with citizens, uh, different citizen segments, with uh, healthcare providers, with community care partners. And we did this through various mechanisms and various platforms, like focus group discussions, uh, broad public engagement, and of course, online consultations as well. And so all these came together and culminated in this um, action plan for successful aging. Then I wanted to give you another example as well that illustrated, that also illustrates um, this consultative and um, engaged uh, and engaging approach that we take as well. And this is the Healthy SG Task Force. And so this task force, um, through this a similar process of engaging wide segments of our um, of our society, came up with recommendations on how to transform Singapore's health promotion landscape. Right, to infuse and integrate health in all aspects of our life, taking a very holistic look at what it means to be healthy from, um, from a, a, a younger age and not just when we're older. And so the initiatives and recommendations from this task force as well as from the action plan should benefit not only older people, but the broader population in Singapore. So we fundamentally, we think that if we want to plan for population aging, it's not something that you can do when you arrive there. It's not something that you can do uh, to prepare for aging when you hit a certain magic number, and it must start early. And so our population health approach um, 
encompasses what we say is a, is, is a life cost perspective. It should span all stages from life from cradle to grave because if we want to have good health when we're older, we really do need to start. And, and all this good health really rests on foundations that we build when we're younger. <clears throat> so we see it's important to focus on upstream prevention and not just downstream care. We think it's important to promote health and not just to provide health care. And so to this end, what we've what we do have in place is preventive um, health and health promotion programs that span across different settings, see from schools to workplaces and to communities. And the, uh, the intent of this, <coughs> excuse me, is to address the different health needs um, as they evolve over the course of a person's life. So let me give you a couple of illustrations and I'll just use just one, um, one example of, of screening. Using screening as an example, these um, will show you how different types of preventive health programs can be targeted at different age groups. Um, in schools, we have the school health service, which is on this side, and the school health service will uh, is, promotes health uh, in schools to our school children through education, through regular checkups for uh, vision, for dental and oral health as well, and provides immunization. So this is done by our health promotion board. Then we have Screen for Life, which is um, this initiative in the middle. Basically, it's, this is a national screening program that encourages Singaporeans to go for regular health screening and follow up so that there can be early detection as well as timely management of conditions such as high blood uh, cholesterol, hypertension, and diabetes before they lead on and cause even more um, serious conditions. So it's, it's again reflective of a life course approach. Uh, screening starts at 25 for females with uh, cervical, for cervical cancer. And for other chronic illnesses, uh, screening starts from 40 for other adults. And there are also, um, I just want to briefly mention that there are also generous subsidies in place to make this very affordable and accessible for Singaporeans. And then finally on this side, which is also still on screening, but it is a program that's tailored towards our seniors. So this is a Project Silver Screen, which also as a side point reflects um, the importance of partnership and um, working together with different segments. And this is a partnership with our business community to bring functional screening into the community for seniors. So the idea behind it, and this is screening for, um, for vision, for dental, as well as for um, hearing. And the idea is to detect early these conditions and to provide timely intervention. So this intervention could be a treatment in terms of follow-up or else assistive devices. And the whole point of this is really just to improve the well-being and the quality of life for our seniors. <clears throat> so I wanted to just also talk about uh, our approach, our community-based approach and how we do this on the whole of community effort in terms of four key areas. And this is really about access to care, the variety of services, care transition, and finally, just a note about caregivers, which we think are very, um, very integral to be able to unleash the potential of healthy longevity. So I think in terms of um, access, just wanted to make the point about how we have uh, stepped up the pace of growth for health and community care. In, additional to, in addition to institutional care. And we've also recognized that um, improving the variety of services is very key. And so one example here I'll, I'll give you is on our integrated home and daycare package, which allows us to provide services across different settings, across the home setting and as well as a daycare setting. So in, in recognition that people's needs and conditions may change over time. So just because a senior is um, well enough to go down to a center for care services on one day doesn't mean that it doesn't take a turn for the worse or he feels poorly and he needs something at home. And so often from an institutional basis, <laughs> David, you mentioned that sometimes institutions are the problem, we tend to look at it in silos. And this is our attempt to look at it from a more person-centric point of view. 
Care transition is also very key, such that um, the care needs of our seniors don't drop as they go across different settings, especially from the community, uh, the acute care sector to uh, primary care and community care. And this is one uh, pilot program that we are trying out to see how these protocols can work. And finally, for caregivers, we think that this is very key. And last year in 2019, we launched a Caregiver Support Action Plan. And this covers five key areas in navigation, financial support, workplace support, respite, uh, empowerment, and training. And then I think this one, I just wanted to make the point that uh, social and health needs are closely integrated. And it's very artificial to separate what we do for health and social. It's really a matter of construct of the way we organize ourselves. But to an individual, you can't separate the, the, um, the social aspects from the health aspects. And lack of social support can lead to health deterioration and also vice versa. So this kind of describes what we do to address that under this program that we have called the Community Networks of, for Seniors. It basically takes a three-pronged approach of touching, holding, and caring for our seniors with uh, the, in partnership with a wide range of stakeholders. So um, I would also want to take you through a quick look uh, at a community-based approach from the lenses of the assets that we have on the ground. And these assets would be our senior centers. So it's senior activity centers in Singapore where the well seniors may drop in on a more social basis to take part in social activities. Ranging from that to um, senior care centers, which uh, seniors who have higher care needs may come in for, for um, assistance and for care. There are also rehab centers um, <clears throat> that are in the community, um, medical and nursing care centers. So given this wide network of assets of, future, of uh, senior centers on the ground, I, what we hope to achieve in the future is that they can take a population-based approach to hold all our seniors through a baseline suite of services. And this baseline suite of services is intended to include active aging programs to get seniors out of their homes into the community, uh, whether it's for education or exercise programs or wellness talks. And um, the other part of the baseline suite of services is also monitoring or befriending, where the centers will take a more active approach in engaging our vulnerable seniors and to befriend them, to ensure that they have the care that they need and that they're not socially isolated, which is a very key and real concern for aging. And also staging basic care and support for information and referral uh, for seniors to know where to go in terms of the care that they need so that they don't fall through. As I mentioned earlier, care transition is very important. Knowing where to go for what kind of services they need is very key. So I'd like to just end off uh, very quickly. I know we're short of time and I really want to keep the time also for a conversation. Just want to end off with the thought that planning for aging really is very much a continual journey. And we do need to move towards a whole of society approach. So as the saying goes, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I think it similarly takes a village for us to age well and age successfully. I talked a bit earlier about the action plan for successful aging. We're embarking on a refresh of that and we hope to deepen the partnership with our citizens, with our community organizations, our stakeholders, the corporate, uh, the corporate uh, sector as well, so that we can not only meet the needs and aspirations of our seniors today, but also for our seniors tomorrow. And we want to do this through a narrative, um, and we, we think the narrative is very important, and I think that has to do also with the social norms that David was talking about. And we want a narrative that's built on care, contribution, and connectedness, or the three Cs, where society really views aging as a force, a positive force, and an opportunity for meaningful pursuits. So while it's important, I think, for governments to continuously review what we do to help our citizens prepare for longevity, equally important is the responsibility that each of us have to start planning and taking action early, because 
it is the, the good outcomes and the positive outcomes for from doing so will take time to materialize and it's not something that will happen overnight and so through this this is how we hope to envis uh, achieve our health um, outcomes the outcomes that we envisage for our nation for our people to live well to live long and with peace of mind so with that i hope i'm not too much over time thank you very much for your attention Julian, thank you so much. Um, what, a, what a great series of talks, and actually with uh, deep in interconnections between all three of them, I think. Um, the wisdom of the creators of this workshop give us actually time to think about all of this together for the, for the next 40 minutes or so. And I, what I'd like to do first is to just try and um, summarize the themes that I've heard here briefly and then turn it over to all of you to think how we take this forward. <clears throat> um, I, certainly our, our three speakers have taken us on a, on a very important journey to, to note and weave together the importance of um, for healthy longevity, taking a life course approach and building institutional approaches that um, are strong at the population level, at the community level, at the clinical level, and in terms of thinking about environment and norms, and, and helping us see the, a lot of the specifics about how we actually need to transform all of these systems toward what you were saying, Charlene, about a whole of society approach. I think we also have have heard um, about the, the evidence we now have that in many places is not being used. So um, David talked about the huge disparities in the opportunity for both longevity and health span that we are seeing, um, which are quite challenging and necessitate attention. But the flip side of that one could say is that these natural experiments of what happens to human well-being when human beings actually get the benefits of all of these investments that we've just talked about, a life course approach to health promoting conditions and opportunities, education, um, the right public health systems that invest in health at a population, healthier environments, and of course the right medical and social care systems. Um, lo and behold, when those happen, uh, human beings seem to flourish and have, as you said, David, 15 years longer life expectancy. But the data are also very strong that health span approximates life expectancy in that group. So that's in some ways a revelation we didn't have 20 years ago, along with the data we didn't have in the, um, three decades ago, to go to what Jay was talking about, that actually prevention works and matters. That w certainly when I was in training, that was an argument, not an assertion. Um, so <laughs> we, we know not only that, that most of not all, but most of the chronic diseases, prevention does work and matter quite substantially, and that it needs to be de delivered intentionally through all these systems. And, and f finally, I think we can link all these together to say if we direct prevention to your red zone, Jay, in your slide of frailty and disability, and certainly that's what Dr. Martin was talking about, I think, as well, that we have the opportunity to um, uh, upend any assumptions that there's dependency in the old age dependency ratio. Um, because, in fact, we have understood how to not just drive health from the the in, in the internal milieu of the human being, but how to support f capability and function environmentally and unleash what Charlene was saying in terms of the huge opportunities of longer lives, which we have only begun to have an inkling of, but are quite huge. So you just covered a huge amount. Thank you for that. And, and now, um, of course, David 
Canning left us with a pro provocation. <laughs> Uh, and Charlene, some of the answers to say that uh, our premises and our institutions have it exactly backwards in terms of implementing yesterday's evidence for, um, for tomorrow's society. So I'd like to turn this to, to our audience of the world's experts uh, to help us create a, a few things in this conversation, a true future back vision of where we need to go, what our disruptive actions need to be, and how do we think about whole society transformations with health systems getting it right at the center? Yes. Uh, Ike Yeo from Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, proposition about future bank. Uh, there are two, two uh, issues I wish to bring up for discussion. One in terms of the, uh, the, the vision and the equality which we have just touched upon. I think one of the problems with uh, the other would be the institutions that are required and the paradigms that are required to, to, to uh, create that vision. The, the, the equality issue is something that we need to look at because it's a, a question in terms of what we value of each human person. When we look at the healthy lifespans, we are, we are aggregating data. But what is, what's healthy to one person is different to and not from another person. So the preferences, the meaning of, of uh, that life to that person is quite important. So in our, in our metrics, we need to build in the components of the diversity of populations, the diversity of people. It's the opportunities that, that, that must be given to individuals for a meaningful life. And if a meaningful life is different for each person. People with disabilities, people with impairments can have a very meaningful life. So how do we aggregate that, become, that this then becomes meaningful? Because if we just aggregate the data, the inequalities will continue. So it, it really goes in back to society in terms of what we value from, of each human person. The humanity, which is important, that should drive our, our future longevity vision. And if we think of, of, about that, then the institutions and paradigms must change. Because we are so used to saying that we have got to go to school, preschool, schooling, then we, we go to university, then we work, and then we retire. But of course, that life course is, is artificial. It's created by our social institutions. And it's a question in terms of if we change that whole paradigm, if we value individuals, value their preferences, their needs, reference their preferences, how then is the economic structure going to be constructed? How then is society going to change? How do we enable each person to have those opportunities and give them the choices? So it's the individual choice that's important, not what we think is important for them. So I just want the panel to, to discuss that. Thank you, very, very powerful set of points. So not only do we need to understand how to invest across the life course to resolve inequality of opportunity for health, but how do we value the diversity of goals in older age. Um, David, since there was an economic core to the question, do you want to offer a response? Uh, yes. Uh, no, I thought it was a very good question. And I, I, I would like to emphasize that uh, this, this point about meaning. I think uh, people want their lives to have meaning, and we have to respect that. And I think there, there's a problem with economics is that we think the only meaning of life is to make money. And that is not the meaning of life. You make money so you can get other things. The, the, the purpose of, and that leads to, I think, a devaluing of older people if they're not working. Uh, I actually very much like Amartya Sen's argument about uh, capabilities. There is an issue that when we try to measure human welfare, that may be too ambitious a goal. What is welfare is a deep philosophical question. It's about the meaning of life and what we're trying to achieve. And we may have different interpretations. I think what Sen emphasized is a capabilities approach which is what we, we should measure is human capabilities. We give people the capabilities to have a meaningful life, but how they live that life is up to them. And a fundamental capability is a healthy lifespan. It's very hard to, take, to have a meaningful life unless you have a long lifespan that is healthy, and then you, you, get to, you get to do what you want with that. And I think as part of those capabilities would also include education and income. Income not as a goal, but income as a capability for other things. And so I think our metrics should be one of capabilities rather than welfare. 
and we leave it up to the individual what they do with these uh, capabilities. The other thing about uh, uh, targeting is uh, I, I was a, a little bit involved many years ago in the Millennium Development Goals, and I actually thought it was a meaningless exercise at the beginning. We set targets for countries in terms of poverty reduction and in terms of um, uh, reducing child mortality. But it actually had an enormous impact. So setting targets can be very motivational. Uh, the targets are to some extent arbitrary, but if we were to set a target, if we were to have a meaningful metric such as healthy lifespan and set targets for an increase in 10 years or an increase in 10%, and then held countries accountable for meeting those targets, that might be a very, very powerful approach. That, but that, in, that requires that we have a meaningful target, which I think should be a fundamental human capability target, and then we hold countries accountable for achieving that target. I, I, I did put it when I, uh, before, but I actually think it has a value. And the other value it has, as I mentioned, is once you have this target, then people have to come up with an evidence base as to why their intervention helps achieve that target. And so I think targeting for the long-term perspective, targeting for where we want to go, might actually be a useful uh, activity. I'd like to ask Charlene one follow-up on from your question. So, <clears throat> um, at the prior workshop that the Commission held, the point was made, and there was a lot of discussion about how we need to build social new kinds of social institutions that create connection and engagement that also are part of health and well-being for for people at every age. But we have not built the societal institutions for older adults that enable them to contribute in the ways that different individuals might find not only meaningful individually, but critically important to secure a better society and, and future. Do you want to add to that, um, unpack what you were saying in response to the question, and then we'll go on to the next question. Yeah, I, I think those, hello? Yeah, I, so I, I thought that was a really great question um, about diversity or preferences, and I think what you've overlaid on uh, on the institutions, on the social institutions. I think uh, data and metrics and targets are very important questions, very important questions with no clear answers, especially when we move away from what we might see as harder sciences like of economics, which is more quantifiable, moving into what we often see um, as the relatively fluffier aspects of well-being and welfare. And trust me, we've had a lot of conversations with my Ministry of Finance colleagues on this. We want money to do stuff, and they ask us, how are you going to measure the outcome for this? So if you have the answer to that in silver bullet, that would help us a lot. But I, I think um, I would also say that a complementary perspective to that is how do we give voice to the preferences of um, the, the multitudes of preferences of people in terms of what is meaningful to them, what is purposeful to them. And because the sheer spectrum of these preferences can be so wide, uh, I think therein lies the challenge, especially for governments and for institutions to synthesize that and design systems and uh, policies and programs which then do give voice to these preferences. Because when we look at policies and we look at systems um, uh, and programs, it's necessarily designed for a majority. And if you do that, it doesn't cater for the variety and um, the spectrum of preferences. So I think that's where perhaps um, we can see potential for the social institutions to come in and to uh, flourish and to give a voice. And that could be an avenue to give a voice to these multitudes of preferences that come up from uh, different segments of society and different people uh, d different at different stages of their life and life course. How can we do that in a way that's meaningful, in a way that can still feed into systems and policies and programs? Perhaps that's where social institutions can come in and have a role um, in that space. Just wanted to add that thought to the Thank discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Oh, um, I don't know which side to go to first, Dr. Halter, and then over to the other side. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I'm Jeff Halter. I'm a geriatrician from the University of Michigan in the US. 
and a visiting professor here at National University of Singapore. Thank you, uh, speakers, wonderful presentations. And Professor Canning talked about particularly institutional change. Uh, I'm wondering how can we pull this off? They're wonderful, I've seen wonderful programs here in Singapore that were described at the community level, instituted by the government. We have wonderful health care systems all around the world, but many of them, certainly the one I'm at at Michigan, even the one here that's changing, very hospital-centric, focused on the needs of sick people in the hospital. How do we break down the barriers, change the institutional perspective to link our wonderful health care providers and systems with community-based needs? In 25 words or less. Yeah, and thank you. That's the hardest question in the world. Um, so institutional change uh, is a euphemism. Um, you know, so actually, uh, when I, I grew up in uh, Northern Ireland uh, near Belfast, and we had a phrase, we used to say, I'm actively engaged in promoting institutional change. <laughs> and that was a euphemism for the armed struggle. Uh, so <laughs> institutional change is not an easy thing. Um, and it, societal change is not an easy thing. It's, it's very, very difficult to do. And the reason it is difficult to do is there are interest groups who are happy with the current arrangement. If, uh, if everyone benefited from institutional change, it'd be quite easy. But there are powerful inst interest groups that like the current institutions. And we've set up a health system which is treatment oriented and people like, uh, and doctors like to treat people. I think there's, uh, ev there's strong evidence on prevention, um, but actually the demand for, from patients is much more for treatment. They don't think too much about prevention before they're sick, but they do want treatment. So the political demands are for treatment. We have an, we have a, an institution which likes to treat people and gets paid for treating people, and changing that is incredibly difficult. So I think uh, institu you know, institutional change sounds uh, an, like an easy thing, but it's an incredibly difficult thing. But I do think uh, the first stage is changing mindsets. We have to recognize the problem and recognize where we want to go, which I think is this forward-looking thing. If you think about where we want to go rather than where we're starting from, it may help uh, in this change. I think it's really unfortunate that uh, it may be that the, only, the institutional change will come about only when the unsustainable systems become obviously unsustainable. We may actually wait until it's very, very late. Um, and so I think this long-term planning and looking to the future and changing early is obviously the rational response and a much more welfare-inducing response, but it's difficult. Sherlyn, you used the phrase uh, renegotiating the terms. Um, do you ha can you add any insight on, on this? Well, I, I guess I would add that uh, I, I completely agree that it's about mindsets. And I completely agree it's about social norms. Um, it, it's, it's, very, it's very straightforward to say, I, I want medical care when I'm falling sick. It's how when um, a person's younger and you, have, um, you, you think you're immortal and you're not going to fall sick. <laughs> and, and that's where you, know, it, you really need to start planting the seeds of renegotiating um, the contract because by the time you get to the point where he's collecting on the price, it's going to be a bit too late. Um, I, I've been in this job for a bit less than a year and I must confess that prior to this, I've never really paid very much attention. I mean, I'm a caregiver. I've, uh, a couple of years ago, I lost my father-in-law uh, to, to severe dementia and then my mother-in-law is a stroke patient, my parents are older, and so it's not that it's, aging is a completely alien topic to you, to, to me, but I must say I never really thought about it from a very individual point of view. And so then it then raises the question, what exactly does it mean to get people to, to change these norms and mindsets? And I think this is where perhaps a multidisciplinary approach really needs to come into play. And I would say um, disciplines like behavioral sciences, how, uh, psychology, how do we get into the minds of people and how do we do this in a way that's effective for these mindsets to change early on rather than when time is 
running out and we're looking at the price of the bargain. In some ways, this is a public goods problem where health is, uh, uh, the evidence would say, requires a life course of investment for people who aren't demanding it. Um, and yet everybody gains. Where should the locus of responsibility be to make sure those investments are made? Uh, question over here, very patient, thank you. Thank you, it's Adelina Comas Herrera from Dolando School of Economics and uh, Mobzi going to pick up on sustainability. And uh, I agree with, at all, completely with your assessment, but I also think that we need to be a bit more, a bit nuanced on how we talk about sustainability. Quite often we just mean fiscal sustainability, how much we're spending uh, in public uh, funding on health, long-term care, pensions, but actually sustainability is much more than that. And we need to think not only of fiscal sustainability, not only at the percentage of GDP we're spending, which I think we could argue many countries is not high enough, particularly for long-term care, but we also need to think about what's economically sustainable, and for that we need to look at the opportunity costs of not taking action. And I think we really, really need to articulate much better the case for healthy aging in that context. And I also want to emphasize that we, there's political sustainability, there's social sustainability, and we need to take all this into account when we talk about whether aging and our approaches to aging are sustainable or not, and how we change that, and how we reach to a point where it's politically unsustainable not to take action on this. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, you have any response to the case for healthy aging? Well, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, and, and it relates to the question that came up about the value of life uh, at, at every age. So just briefly, when my father was 90, in his early 90s, but princ principally about 95, um, after his birthday, just about every year at that age, I, I, my mother was alive at the time, I would turn to him and I would go, uh, Dad, did you get lucky last night? And he knew exactly what I was asking him. And uh, his big smirk on his face, and he goes, I, I get lucky every day as long as I'm waking up healthy. And, uh, that, uh, and he was happy. Even though there were things that were going wrong with his body, which I'm now beginning to understand, um, because he, I, and now that I think of it, because you know I'm at the young age of 65, and I'm at the age that my dad retired mm -hmm. as a plumber, um, and so the only thing of value to him really was healthy life, and I would would ask him this at whatever age he was in his mid 90s, and um, and the answer was always the same: the the most valuable commodity, the most precious commodity to him, and just about everyone else that I've ever talked to is healthy life. And um, interestingly enough, once my mother passed away, all those concepts of happiness and whatnot um, took a quick nosedive. So things change very rapidly based on life circumstances. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong. <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, John Wong from Singapore. Um, I'd like to really again thank the, 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 you know, the whole panel for a terrific uh, uh, session. Um, you know, I think ultimately, if, if we are going to make progress, probably the keys are going to be institutions, as uh, David quite rightly pointed out, and ministries, so Charlene. Um, and I think institutions and ministries ultimately look at indices. And, you know, I would really hope that out of this workshop, we try and look at some of the best indices and how to improve them. I think there are people in this room who took part in the development of an aging index. Uh, um, and so can we try and look at indices? And then we are living in probably the most data-rich period of history. And really trying to see how can we put in data and the feedback loops to see whether we're on the right track to meet those indices. And then the economists come in with the incentives. Uh, because I think that unless we have a learning system where we are committed to achieving a certain goal, and there's nothing like, you know, I mean, institutions, CEOs, and ministries are always held accountable. So if there was this index that we could constantly reference to see whether we're on the right track, you know, could we get there? And, you know, I think the aging index said that the Nordic countries currently lead the whole table. Uh, I'd love to hear from anyone from the Nordic countries uh, what their comments are based on this morning's session. Thank you. 
Jay, do you want to comment? Yeah, so great question. Um, and in case you're not aware, the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on an Aging Society, of which there are many members here, dealt with this issue specifically on the problem with you know, the age of dependency ratio and the creation of a new index. And it has been published. Um, and people should be aware of this uh, new index. And I'm anticipating there will come a time in the near future when this index becomes more widely understood and used so that countries can better gauge where they are relative to everyone else, not using the problems that are accompany this inappropriate age of dependency ratio. So these new indices are out there now. Thank you. John, do uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, and it ties in, I think, with this idea of how do we change systems? Because, um, I mean, it's one thing to advocate a broad vision for how the system needs to change, but I actually think what also works is the Trojan horse approach. And we identify the tools which we embed in the system without it understanding that ultimately will drive it to change. And I think this idea of indices or of measuring the outcomes we're trying to look at is really important. I think we need to be a little bit more ambitious though, and I think we're talking about healthy longevity, and I think one of the things I'd like to see comes out of the, this couple of days in the next meeting is really thinking about this term health, because I think we are still very much driven by the idea of health being the absence of disease, and we need to be thinking about much broader measures of health, and, and I think that goes back even to looking at the impacts of the geroscience that you were talking about, Jay. So uh, I, just, I, I support what people are saying very much, but I actually think we need to be even more ambitious. Well, that's probably a perfect setup for Dr. Reddy. Uh, well, uh, Professor Channing has very clearly described why we need to think in terms of a cluster of human capabilities to define welfare, rather than just look at an upward spiral of economic growth. And the question of institutional changes come up. Are we limiting the opportunities for the current generation, younger generation, to bring about the benefits of institutional change for themselves by irreparably damaging some of the institutions which will support healthy aging. Environment, for example. The multiple human conflicts that we have triggered, for example, across the world. To what extent are the opportunities for the younger generation, which may actually be thinking in terms of human welfare in different terms than merely economic growth, how are we limiting their opportunities to define healthy aging for themselves in the future? and to influence the course of that healthy aging. Uh, to borrow a phrase, have, have we made Faustian bargains for which they will praise the price, or are they capable of changing it in terms of the momentum? David, do you want to take the first response to that? Thank you for fo focusing on me for the easy questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. The rest of us will help. Yes. Um, yeah, so I do think. I mean, I do think that uh, there's a huge problem of the environment, particularly air pollution. There's some recent evidence that air pollution, even well below the, the current WHO threshold levels, is having large-scale effects both on child health and on health of older populations. There's a recent very good study on death in the Medicare population, and it's linked to uh, exposure to air pollution. Um, I also think, uh, uh, I think Jay, you know, when he talked about his uh, sort of declines in um, life expectancy, had some focus on obesity as a cause. And I, and I do think that there, there is this sort of uh, industrial complex of food companies who design foods to be addictive. And young people get addicted because you're fighting against scientists who are designing the foods to make them addictive. And that is a bizarre state of the world that we allow that to happen. So I think there are issues around reducing economic growth, but improving health, particularly through combating uh, this designed obesity and combating air pollution, both of which will be expensive. Um, so I, I do think there, there is an emerging problem uh, which is coming from not focusing enough. And I, I would just like to uh, comment um, on, um, 
on John's point about better metrics. I'm all in favor of better metrics. I think we should have a good uh, metric. But the, the best is enemy of the good. Any metric is going to be imperfect. And it's much more important to have an agreed metric and set targets rather than spend decades improving the metric. And I, I've seen this in many uh, aspects. So if you look at even the, the goals of poverty reduction and uh, reducing child mortality, Millennium Development Goals, they're not perfect metrics. They miss quite a lot of interesting things. And I think it's, m it's more important to set targets even with imperfect metrics rather than spend a lot of time coming up with more theoretically grounded and better metrics. I mean, again, that's an anti-academic view. The academic would like to think more and get better measures. But I think the, the need for action pushes you towards using metrics, even if imperfect. There's another um, dimension, perhaps, of what, you're, of what you're bringing out that I think is also, we, we, we actually haven't really touched on here, which is um, a perception that investing in older people takes um, resources out of the, uh, away from the needs of the young. And, and there's a narrative change here that perhaps we need because we now understand, just as David was saying, and you well know, that the same environmental pollutants that are harming our young people's futures are also har harming our old people's health. There is no, there is no contradiction if we invest in a healthy environment, then actually the health we're investing in health futures for everybody will matter. Um, we're, we're harming neurocognitive development in young people with air pollutants and, um, and pesticides, and we're harming um, cognition of older people with the same substances. I was just hoping that the definition of public health in the title there would take in all of these dimensions yeah. not just look at the conventional health systems. Right. So very important, but there's another, there's another point that we've learned, which is, of course, that designing for, on the one hand, designing systems that will um, be great for an aging population, I consistently turn out to be better for all ages, consistently. And on the other hand, if we invest in the health of young people, heavily through public health approaches, we're positioning them for better, longer lives. So how we change the narrative to go to what Charlene was saying, that, that we're all in this one together, is, going, is, is critically important to accomplish goals, but also for societal cohesion. So this is not perceived to be uh, a basis for intergenerational warfare, which it is not. Um, have we actually run out of questions? That cannot be. Yes. Uh, Nishikawa from Japan. Uh, I'm from Ministry of Economy, uh, working in the government. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> My question is, then, you know, the, I, I really appreciate the excellent panels, and also I agree with them various issues and the challenges you pointed out. Uh, my question is then, how much you will expect government role or the public role, public health systems, uh, to uh, provide solution? to your issues or challenges? Or the, how much we should expect the you know, market mechanism, individual uh, mindset change, or the business uh, solutions are the outside of the government? The, uh, to be frank with you, the government is very good at to provide, let's say, the, for example, the uh, very equal uh, medical treatment to anyone. Uh, the, my, our Ministry of Health is very good at such kind of things. However, the, uh, government is very not, not good at to, how can I say, to intervene, individual mindset, individual lifestyle. So the diversity of the people, the meaning of the lifestyle, life, the government cannot define. So I, my question is now how you will expect what kind of things government should do to s address your issues and what kind of things individual or the business should do to address the issues. Sorry, very broad questions. This is, this is such a critical question. Maybe we can go down the row here with responses and then uh, everybody in this audience is tackling this in one way or another. I'd love to hear what others say. Um, I, I'll just start by, uh, in addition to agreeing that it's a critical is, issue to understand in a whole of society problem what, what the responsibility of each sector has to be 
and how they play together. That's, that's one question. And then how do you define <laughs> what the roles of each and responsibilities of each sector should be in a shared set of aspirations? Um, I also, just to go back to Srinath's point, want to say that there are many definitions of public health rolling around, used differently in different nations, and so it's important for us to clarify. Uh, there's certainly, for many countries, the definition of public health, as I understand it, is governmentally provided medical care in particular. The U.S. National Academy of Medicine's definition are the actions that we take collectively to secure the health of the public, uh, particularly through population-based preventive and health-promoting approaches. But um, there are many other definitions going around. Uh, we'll just go down the line, and then I'd invite others to stand up and comment on what you believe different institutional responsibilities should be, government, private sector, uh, communities, et cetera. Um, and, and the medical system. Yeah, so I mean, this is a really good question. So briefly, in the world of, uh, of aging and aging biology, I'm not confident at all that, that uh, governments are going to have much of an impact at all. There's a lot of talk um, that you know, they want to they want set goals. But frankly, from personal experience, when we've made an effort to convey some of these messages to the federal government, we uh, were met with deaf ears. Um, there were political issues that got in the way, and it's too little money that happens too slow. So we're going elsewhere. We're going to individuals that have larger sums of money that are willing to make an impact and get in on the ground floor of a major new public health movement. So I'm not entirely convinced that governments are going to influence what we're particularly interested in going after, which is this effort to, to modulate biological aging. There's lots of other ways in which the government can get, get involved, but in terms of the breakthrough that we're talking about, I'm not particularly optimistic it's going to come from the government. Yeah, I, I, I just want to actually emphasize another institution that we haven't really talked about very much, which is the family. And I think the family is incredibly important in aging. And the reason it's so important is one of the big problems, I think, is uh, age segregation. The way we organize work in society, the ages get very segregated. It, it, there's also class segregation. But the family actually, uh, uh, and I think Jay was talking about his, uh, his father, the, the family is the reason I think we don't have this uh, conflict between generations to the, to the extent that we have in other ways, because the family includes people of all ages, of older people and younger people. And I think the family is a very important institution in this, uh, in this framework. And I think it is, it is a mistake to think governments can do everything. And there are lots of things governments are good at, but there are lots of things that they're really bad at as well. But I would just emphasize that to some extent, the, the welfare state in many countries has sort of uh, usurped the role of the family and said, really, the family doesn't have a role, the state will look after you. And I think supporting families in their role may be a better model than uh, putting everything onto the state. So I think strengthening the family and supporting the family would, is a very important uh, mechanism. Charlene? Thanks. I, I think that's a really good question about the roles of the different sectors in our society and in our country. I think for um, looking at the role of the government, uh, it will continue to be a necessary, but I think an insufficient one. And I think given the complexities of the challenges that we're facing, the traditional sort of uh, transactional approach vis-a-vis -vis the government, where the government provides services and then the people receive the services, I think that is not going to be enough. There's certainly still relevant, but it's not going to be necessary. And I think that links back to an earlier theme on sustainability that was raised. It's not going to be sustainable because the challenges that we face today are so multidimensional and so complex that this way of operating, this single dimensional way of operating is not going to be sufficient. And I think it's also not going to be thoroughly effective. I mean, there's the, the effectiveness will reach a certain limit if we continue in this model of working where it's a sort of two-way transactional um, relationship between society, the people, and the government. 
So I, I would use, um, so I think the government still is important, still has a role to play, not only in the delivery of some of these services, but I think also in the facilitating of these dialogues. So I use um, our efforts at refreshing our action plan. I talked earlier about our action plan for successful aging, and we're right now in the midst of uh, a refresh of that action plan. And we see our role very much as facilitating the efforts of the different segments of our country and of our society to come together to own and create different pieces of this with us. And so it's not just um, an a feedback and input gathering session where you kind of come and put a wish list to the government and say this is what needs to be done, but how can we engender um, uh, a working compact or working relationship where we, attack, where, where we, where we um, approach these questions and these challenges together as a society, together as a community, with um, different parts of the society and the community playing different roles. Um, in terms of the creation, the ownership, and the delivery of what needs to be able to turn aging into a positive force. Thank you. Dr. Zhao, do you have a comment? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I was just going to say, great session. Uh, outstanding discussion on these issues. Uh, on the index, I agree with uh, David that it doesn't have to be perfect. The World Bank did a human capital index, and they're able to at least mobilize countries to say we need to move towards that because they're able to um, correlate a 15-year index to, at least in the economist terms, GDP growth, right? So education matters, uh, healthcare matters, and our question would be, what kind of index do we want to do, look at healthy longevity, not just aging index? And uh, I'd be interested in hearing more MacArthur index, but the question is converted to the issue of healthy longevity, not aging. On the issue of government public-private partnership, I think it's got to be a balance. I think you're a little too negative on the government. Let me put it this way. Absolutely, free market approach, which our country is so good at, Give us tons of innovation, but look at the inequities. Government has to come in to balance those inequities, right? So I think when we put this initiative together, it was in the minds of public-private partnership. How do you achieve that balance? In many ways, you have raised those questions, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, for example, the competition, the global competition, is funded by government and private sector, J and J. European Investment Bank, METI, as well as, in fact, the MOH in Singapore, AMED in Japan, and uh, NIH, and so on and so forth. It's a public-private partnership to increase innovation, right? I would agree with you that to take to market it involves a very different set of skill set. But still, the government allows our ability to have technology assessment equalized and have an equity playing field, which I think is so important. So there's, no, and then of course I'm looking at Marion So, and you have not spoken about community workers. It is a public-private partnership, which is the pre, the purpose of this whole initiative. But thank you. Thank you. So we have, um, I guess, two more minutes. Maybe I can ask each of the panelists to give us um, some final comments. Very, very brief. Charlene, can we reverse order and start with you? Any, any final words for us? Um, well, I'll just go back to some of the themes that have come out, and I think it's really critical for us to take a very comprehensive and all-rounded approach to this issue. I think we really cannot afford to look at it from single lenses of either health or, uh, or, or health care or uh, disease, but I think we really need to take a comprehensive and well-rounded sort of whole person look at how is it we can achieve healthy longevity. David? Yeah, I've really enjoyed this. I mean, um, it, it, maybe it's too age appropriate, but I, I really enjoy intellectual discussions. And I think this has been an incredibly high standard intellectual discussion. I thought the, the questions, uh, more often statements, but that's the nature of these things from the, uh, from the audience were wonderful. And I actually think uh, we have made some progress here. And I, and I actually think I've learned a lot, and I think we, I, can see, I can start to see a way forward. Fabulous. Jay? So let me just 
emphasize that this forward back approach that you have created, I, I think future is future back. Future back. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Um, <laughs> is brilliant. And and uh, but I don't think we should escape any of these sessions without defining what that future is that we want to see. And so far, we haven't really done that. Mm -hmm. So just I, I just want to emphasize how important I think this is and, and that we should all be doing this. Just so, so I, I come I'm sorry, I can't hear. If you can get them to capture those key things from the session, which might really yes. encapsulate that, so or write them up here. We, um, do you want to each say that? The three things that should encapsulate the session? No, I'll tell you what I've already I've that. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm, mishear I'm mishearing you. So, the importance of institutional change. Um, evidence is not being used. Prevention works and matters. Um, but we have to direct prevention to the red zone. That was what I picked up from you saying earlier. So were there other key points that people wanted up here? I, I think I would just add one more word to that, and that's partnership. So I think that partnership among um, the public, private, among, among private, among social, the people sector, the people sectored with government, I think partnerships is going to be critical in this future back vision. I would say we've been talking to a future vision of how many different institutions will have changed. Um, and um, we've, we've gone through many sectors. I'll just, because I know it's time to end, say that back to something Victor said, my personal dream is that if we get this right, the World Bank will, um, will modify their human capital index to recognize that there's return on investment in old age, which they at the moment deny. Thank you.